This story takes place in the middle of nowhere. A nameless fisherman has found a job as an angler in the town called Greater Marrow. The fisherman, I'll call him Matthew, gets into dense fog and collides with the rock cliff. Arrival sets the scene for what we might expect next. Luckily for him, it was part of an interview to get the job. The mayor of this place happily announces that Matthew is the luckiest one and the only one to get the job. He loans him a brand new boat for which Matthew has to pay a few coins by selling fish. That's the best job of my life. It's as simple as Animal Crossing. Discover new territories, catch fish, enjoy the views, scratch that, it's scary as hell. Fishing here and there, Matthew gets lucky, catching a rare mutated mackerel. He brings it to the fishmonger, who finds a crimson handkerchief inside. The fish covers the loan and Matthew in slightly better stench than his own. Matthew goes back to his boat and sees a creep. There is no such thing as a coincidence. Who is looking at him through the cabin window. This creep needs a nut job who's ready to do an extremely dangerous job. Later, at his home, Home on a lonely island, he takes the handkerchief and from his words it gets clear he had been searching for an old ship that held the cloth. Then he proposes a deal. Since now I must find five relics, a ring, a necklace, a watch, a music box and a key. I agree and in return, as a sign of a goodwill, he installs a dredge crane on the boat. To find relics, I need to ask people around about strange occurrences. One person might see and know more than others. The lighthouse keeper. She looks like she has been living in this lighthouse house with her 20 cats for decades. She's economical with the truth and doesn't like Matthew. She holds the lantern up to make sure it's really him standing in front of her. She doesn't know what he's up to, but she warns that an ill-fated boat returned and Matthew must be careful. I have no idea what she speaks about, but I call her Karen. Karen says at night she saw a red light nearby. Probably something is waiting in the deep. That's all I need. Thanks. Bye. Going to the pier, I meet a woman who is packing her things. She's going to move from this place as far as she can, as her friends did many years ago. She needs some scrap, which I can find in the ocean around ship wreckages, to build her own house on another island. Sure thing I agree. As long as it's not fish and ugly creatures, I'm in. When scrap is found and delivered to the island, I take her on board. go into the island, they catch a fish bigger than her. As you can see, there is no place for both of them. And as a seasoned and conscientious fisherman, I sort out my priorities. How, how can I take you back? <laughs> I didn't know the game would let me do it. <laughs> I sail back to the town and wait until the night. The fog is so dense it shrouds my boat. I see the pillar of light and sail closer. Tremble in my knees goes through the screen, to the boat and to water which attracts a hideous creature I have never seen before. I'm not a pussy but I am, so I catch the relic key as fast as I can and sail back to people. I love them so much, especially this guy and this and... Uh, Karen? I delivered the key to the collector. In return, he opens his crimson book and reads a spell that grants my boat some extra speed. Overdoing it damages engines and makes everything glow red for a few seconds, which I don't like. He is standing at the door and I have no intention to leave. I ask him about his past. 20 years ago, he used to be a fisherman like Matthew, but the ocean banished him, whatever it means, and he stayed on this island. The book that he uses drains powers from the deep and extends the limits of a recipient. Speaking Speaking of the relics, they used to belong to his old friend. He says the next artifact is around Gale Cliffs, the place where I'm going next. All over the place I find barrels with letters inside them. In them I read essential pieces of a big puzzle of a couple's tragic story I'm going to explain to you step by step. The couple was from Gale Cliffs, where now this cyclops monster fish is living. <laughs> I'm friendly, I'm friendly, I'm friendly. Anyway, from this place I discovered the relic music box with the letter J carved on the underside. Much later we'll find out her name was Julie, so for making it convenient I'll call her like that from the get-go. This story advanced on the 22nd of December 1926, when the man made an order for an engraving on the necklace with the words for J, my shining star. After about three months, in the center of the stellar basin, the man proposed to Julie at the conjunction of days of the 6th and 7th March 1926. Currently, this place became home to a monster kraken lying in the deep. On the 1st of June 1927, dies the mother of the man. She bequeathed Julie her pocket watch. Julie thought of it as a jab from the mother-in-law, as she was the type to do such a thing. The 20th of August 1927, the couple had sailed off on their honeymoon. They were around islands at the back of Greater Marrow. On such an occasion, he renamed his boat after her. He called it Julie. He took it more seriously than the wedding. Supposedly, it 
it was very important to perform the renaming ceremony right, unless you want an ill fortune to follow the boat. To hold the ceremony correctly, you had to throw away everything that had an old name on it. Julie decided to keep a keychain though, as she liked the name on it. The same day, they had a slight accident when the rock appeared out of nowhere. The hull wasn't damaged, but some items fell overboard into the water. Julie wasn't sure what was lost, and as we find out later, it was the key from the keychain, the one she kept. Her husband paranoidly went through some notes of the renaming ceremony, worrying that he did something wrong. But he didn't. Julie did. And that's where the trouble began. Additional notes from me that there are two superstitions connected with the ships. The first superstition is that taking women on board would attract bad luck, and the second one is that renaming a boat would bring ill fate, unless there is a ceremony, like in the game, when you get rid of everything that has a previous name on it. Well, as we see, they had one job, and they screwed up. Julie wrote another letter on the 9th of September 1927. She says that her husband had refused to take her on board for different reasons. That the crew will be rude or she will get bored. I believe her husband didn't want to take her on board because first, she would bring bad luck again and second, he already started to go nuts because of a more and more hallucinations he had seen, like hurricanes appearing out of nowhere, rocks and another devilry. On the 14th of September 1927, she wrote that her husband hauled up a wooden casket. At first glance, it was a regular wooden box. They easily opened it and there was the crimson cloth inside. Everybody was dead silent. And the next second, the former mayor heard the voice of something that said it was coming after their breath, because nobody would need it soon. Julie's husband stared down into the open casket. When he turned to Julie, in his eyes there was the void. What we get from that note is that this crimson cloth was just the first key to something more sinister. According to a fisherman's note, the moment after opening the casket there was this thick fog appearing from thin air, and it was much denser at night. Moreover, the opened box brought evil creatures from the depths of the ocean, causing some fish to mutate, and brought monsters like this one. Uh, nope, nope, nope. Julie couldn't keep warm ever since her brain was fogged too, and the former mayor of Greater Marrow went completely crazy begging people to throw it back into the water. He meant the crimson cloth. What happens next is the beginning of the end. I believe Julie's husband drowned in the void, mentally of course. He heard something constantly whispering to his ears, something called him to finish the ritual. The ritual I'll speak about at the end. Then everything will click into one place. Oh my god, come on. What is that again? Stay back, stay back. <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> Does it disappear? The former mayor who lost his mind and who I find later is still alive. He completes the story of the couple. The team and the couple stepped on board together, which again is a bad sign. That night the mayor saw how that damned couple and the boat sailed off at night behind Greater Marrow. Something was following them through the fog and when it finally reached them, there was a blow that wrecked the boat. Some of the crewmates survived and made it to the shore of Greater Marrow, as well as the husband who was still alive and was holding the crimson book covered in Julie's blood. When while Julie was somewhere out there in the abyss of the ocean. I strongly believe this was a part of the ritual the husband must have performed. Sacrifice somebody he loves in exchange for a greater power. I'll repeat the words of Julie. When the casket was opened, her brain was fogged. I'm sure she wasn't the only one who was affected by it. Her husband became a victim of it too. One more thing. One night he might have found mystical rocks around Red Fog, as we can see in the trailer. When he touched it, he witnessed the worst case scenario of the future, how he his wife and the crew haul up the casket, awakening something sinister and bring destruction to this world. That's when he got brainwashed. He realized there was a way out of the marriage of all. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. There is proof of such phenomena that drives you insane in the game. This red fog. When affected for too long, it makes you crazy, which causes weird occurrences like tentacles out of water or red-eyed seagulls that steal your fish. This whisper or visions affected his mind so much he couldn't resist anymore. Therefore, it made him do such an awful act. Maybe it wasn't even him. Stay with me and you will understand what I'm trying to say. Speaking of the destruction, every important place of this couple's life was either cursed or brought nasty creatures to it. For example, in Stellar Basin where Julie was proposed, now there is 
is an old fortress with a scientist living inside. She is supposedly Julie's sister, as she says about notes she finds all the time in unusual places around her workplace. And it can be normal, as her sister died ages ago, but in the notes the scientist finds events that happened after her death. In my opinion, Julie somehow places bottles around these places to find some help, because in some notes there is information that Julie is longing to see her husband, and what's worse, she is still somewhere there in the depths and can't get warm after all these years. I caught myself on the thought that after finding so many notes and going deeper into the story, fishing takes a backseat, but not these nasty monstrosities. There are the notes which lead us to the culmination. The notes were written by an unknown fisherman, about one man. This man knows that five items will rise it. That's where we find ourselves in this story. I kept some information secret to finish the puzzle logically. As you remember, I had already found the crimson cloth. I gave it to the collector, who later showed up with the crimson book, from which he read some spells. I had already collected all relics while I was telling all of this, and as you remember, in the last note it was said that five of the items will summon it. Those items, as you might have guessed, are the necklace, the ring, the key, the music box and the watch. The collector called them the relics to deceive Matthew. Matthew is not stupid. I am. Suspecting nothing, I bring all these relics to him. He takes them and invites us to the final ride. We sail to the place where Julie was killed, to the red beam of light. The collector casts a spell, and as he explains to bring her back, he throws the pocket watch overboard, another relic to release a lost one, frozen in time. At the end, he throws the final item, the crimson book. As it was intended, it brings Julie back, but as a prize, it summons something else. That was the bad ending. That doesn't show us the actual state of things. Let's get back to the moment where I collect all the items. Replaying again, I notice another choice to ask more about the book, because before going to the collector, I'd found the former mayor. He told straight into Matthew's face that Matthew was that cursed husband who held up the casket. Matthew, of course, didn't understand a thing, and there was a reason why. When Matthew had been deceived by the voice in his head, he threw away everything that connected him to his past life. Like with his boat before renaming, he threw away everything that had the previous name on it, in some way to be reborn, by throwing away every present precious thing, including his wife. And as we know, this game considers women as things, he got rid of everything, erasing his past memories. When the ceremony of renaming was done, he turned into somebody else. When Matthew picks up all five relics, it makes him susceptible to his past self. He goes to the collector and before handing everything in, he asks more about the crimson book. The collector plays a cold fish and tries to avoid the details and change the subject to the ritual. But if Matthew insists, the collector gets more and more secretive, which drives Matthew crazy. He punches the collector in the face and realizes that the punch is connected to the mirror, which breaks after the jab. All this time the collector was Matthew's breathless self. Matthew was indeed the husband who started all of this. Remember how the collector showed up at the start of the game? When Matthew picked up the crimson cloth, the occasion where I threw the poor woman over the board was a pure coincidence. It was absolutely unintentional and funny and fit into the story though. The collector said he used to be a fisherman too, about 20 years ago. Keep in mind that he was Matthew all this time. It raises the question of what happened for all these 20 years. Good question. As he said, he had been looking for the last piece of the puzzle, the crimson cloth. The night when Julie was killed, he lost the cloth and then, much later, Matthew has found it in a fish. Also tend to believe Julie broke the ritual of summoning Cthulhu since the beginning because of her presence on the boat, which means she built a cross path for rising supreme evil or sealing it for a long time. I believe the collector was looking for ways how to summon Cthulhu and nothing was working out. It didn't go according to the plan. Then, on a foggy day, he got sloppy, hit the rock and woke up Matthew instead. One way or another, all this time Matthew had the Crimson Book and it is he who cast the spells on himself. Like in the Fight Club. Proof of this we have in the game mechanics. When taking somebody on board, it would take some space in your cargo. But when the collector joins Matthew, there is no trace of him on your boat. So after collecting all five relics, 
weeks. Matthews got stronger. Maybe some memories returned to him. He insisted on knowing more and accidentally broke the spell or dispelled the illusion. After that, you can turn around and sail to Karen. She knew it was Matthew who's done all this from the get-go. She was probably too afraid to say about it out loud, caring for her sanity and 90 cats. Karen lights the way to where it all had happened. When Matthew arrives to the spot, everything happens as it happens in the Lovecraftian stories, with no good ending for anybody. This crazy ass Leviathan consumes the book so nobody would ever use it again. It's Matthew for his sins and mistakes and Julie altogether. In the bad ending, Julie was resurrected, but I kept thinking why was she, if the collector needed to resurrect Cthulhu and him only? Well, probably it was some kind of agreement between two personas, in which Matthew would give away control over his body if Julie was resurrected. This point of view might be explained in my opinion by the genuine and the only bad ending. After speaking with Karen, you still can go back to the collector who is surprised to see you back, but he convinces Matthew once again that the only way to save Julie is to go to her burial place and perform the ritual. Matthew, by his own volition, agrees to fuse with the collector into one person, and together they sail to the spot, knowing the price they resurrect Julie anyway in exchange for a greater evil. I don't know who I was afraid to see more of, this nightmarish fuel or this leviathan. Anyway, I'm gonna pee tonight in my bed, not because of them, just for fun. This game kept me addicted all the way until the end. I would play hundreds of other parts of this game, so much fun I had, even though my fear of sea creatures got worse. If you have any chance of buying and playing this game, please do it, it's worth it. Anyway, thanks for watching, if you have any questions, ask in the comments and probably I will never answer them. Have a nice day, bye!